Section three of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Jenkins. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume One, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section three. Illinois in 1830. The Lincolns arrived in Illinois just in time to entitle themselves to be called pioneers. When, in after years, associations of old settlers began to be formed in central Illinois, the qualification for membership agreed upon by common consent was a residence in the country before the winter of the deep snow. This was in 1830 to 31, a season of such extraordinary severity that it has formed for half a century a recognized date in the middle counties of illinois among those to whom in those days diaries and journals were unknown the snowfall began in the christmas holidays and continued until the snow was three feet deep on level ground then came a cold rain freezing as it fell until a thick crust of ice gathered over the snow the winter became intensely cold, the mercury sinking to 12 degrees below zero Fahrenheit and remaining there for two weeks. The storm came on with such a suddenness that all who were abroad had great trouble in reaching their homes, and many perished. One man relates that he and a friend or two were out in a hunting party with an ox team. They had collected a wagon load of game and were on their way home when the storm struck them. After they had gone four miles, they were compelled to abandon their wagon. The snow fell in heavy masses, as if thrown from a scoop shovel. Arriving within two miles of their habitation, they were forced to trust to the instinct of their animals, and reached home hanging to the tails of their steers. Not all were so fortunate. Some were found weeks afterwards in the snowdrifts, their flesh gnawed by famished wolves, and the fate of others was unknown until the late spring sunshine revealed their resting places. To those who escaped, the winter was tedious and terrible. It is hard for us to understand the isolation to which such weather condemned the pioneer. For weeks they remained in their cabins, hoping for some mitigation of the frost. When at last they were driven out by the fear of famine, the labor of establishing communications was enormous. They finally made roads by wallowing through the snow, as an Illinois historian expresses it, and going patiently over the same track until the snow was trampled hard and rounded like a turnpike. These roads lasted far into the spring, when the snow had melted from the plains and wound for miles like threads of silver over the rich black loam of the prairies. After that winter game was never again so plentiful in the state. Much still remained, of course, but it never recovered entirely from the rigors of that season and the stupid enterprise of the pioneer hunters who, when they came out of their snow-beleaguered cabins, began chasing and killing the starved deer by herds. It was easy work. The crust of the snow was strong enough to bear the weight of men and dogs, but the slender hooves of the deer would, after a few bounds, pierce the treacherous surface. The destructive slaughter went on until the game grew too lean to be worth the killing. All sorts of wild animals grew scarce from that winter. Old settlers say that the slow, cowardly breed of prairie wolves, which used to be caught and killed as readily as sheep, disappeared about that time, and none but the fleeter and stronger survived. Only once since then has nature shown such extravagant severity in Illinois and that was on a day in the winter of 1836, known to Illinoisans as the sudden change. At noon on the 20th of December, after a warm and rainy morning, the ground being covered with mud and slush, the temperature fell instantly 40 degrees. A man riding into Springfield for a marriage license says a roaring and crackling wind came up upon him and the raindrops dripping from his bridle reins and beard changed in a second into jingling icicles he rode hastily into the town and arrived in a few minutes at his destination but his clothes were frozen like sheet iron and man and saddle had to be taken into the house together to be thawed apart 
Geese and chickens were caught by the feet and wings and frozen to the wet ground. A drove of a thousand hogs which were being driven to St. Louis rushed together for warmth and became piled in a great heap. Those inside smothered and those outside froze, and the ghastly pyramid remained there on the prairie for weeks. The drovers barely escaped with their lives. Men killed their horses, disemboweled them, and crept into the cavity of their bodies to escape the murderous wind. Footnote. Although the old settlers of Sagamon County are acquainted with these facts, and we have often heard them and many others like them from the lips of eyewitnesses, we have preferred to cite only these incidents of the sudden change, which are given in the careful and conscientious compilation entitled The Early Settlers of Sangamon County by John Carroll Power. End footnote. The pioneer period of Illinois was ending as Thomas Lincoln and his tall boy drove their ox team over the Indiana line. The population of the state had grown to 157,447. It still clung to the wooden borders of the watercourses. Scattered settlements were to be found all along the Mississippi and its affluence, from where Cairo struggled for life in the swamps of the Ohio to the bustling and busy mining camps which the recent discovery of lead had brought to Galena. A line of villages from Alton to Peoria dotted the woodland, which the Illinois River had stretched like a green baldric diagonally across the bosom of the state. Then there were long reaches of wilderness before you came to Fort Dearborn, where there was nothing as yet to give promise of that miraculous growth which was soon to make Chicago a proverb to the world. There were a few settlements in the fertile region called the Military Tract. The southern part of the state was getting itself settled here and there. People were coming in freely to the Sangamon country, but a grassy solitude stretched from Galena to Chicago, and the upper half of the state was generally a wilderness. The earlier emigrants, principally of the poorer class of southern farmers, shunned the prairies with something of a superstitious dread, they preferred to pass the first years of their occupation in the wasteful and laborious work of clearing a patch of timber for corn rather than enter upon those rich savannas which were ready to break into fertility at the slightest provocation of culture. Even so late as 1835, writes J. F. Speed, no one dreamed the prairies would ever be occupied. It was thought they would be used perpetually as grazing fields for stock. For years the long procession of movers wound over those fertile and neglected plains, taking no hint of the wealth suggested by the rank luxuriance of vegetable growth around them. The carpet of brilliant flowers spread over the verdant knolls, the strong succulent grass that waved in the breeze, full of warm and vital odor, as high as the waist of a man. In after years, when the emigration from the northern and eastern states began to pour in, the prairies were rapidly taken up, and the relative growth and importance of the two sections of the state were immediately reversed. Governor Ford, writing about 1847, attributes this result to the fact that the best class of southern people were slow to emigrate to a state where they could not take their slaves, while the settlers from the north, not being debarred by the state constitution from bringing their property with them, were of a different class. The northern part of the state was settled in the first instance by wealthy farmers, enterprising merchants, millers, and manufacturers. They made farms, built mills, churches, schoolhouses, towns, and cities, and constructed roads and bridges as if by magic, so that although the settlements in the southern part of the state are from twenty to fifty years in advance on the score of age, yet they are ten years behind in point of wealth and all the appliances of a higher civilization. At the time which we are especially considering, however, the few inhabitants of the South and the Center were principally from what came afterward to be called the border slave states. They were mostly a simple, neighborly, unambitious people, contented with their condition, living upon plain fare, and knowing not much of anything better. Luxury was, of course, unknown. Even wealth, if it existed, could procure few of the comforts of refined life. There was little or no money in circulation. Exchanges were effected by the most primitive forms of barter, and each family had to rely chiefly upon itself for the means of living. 
the neighbors would lend a hand in building a cabin for a newcomer. After that he must in most cases shift for himself. Many a man, arriving from an old community and imperfectly appreciating the necessities of pioneer life, has found suddenly on the approach of winter that he must learn to make shoes or go barefoot. The furniture of their houses was made with an axe from the trees of the forest. Their clothing was all made at home. The buckskin days were over to a great extent, though an occasional hunting shirt and pair of moccasins were still seen but flax and hemp had begun to be cultivated, and as the wolves were killed off, the sheepfolds increased, and garments resembling those of civilization were spun and woven and cut and sewed by the women of the family. When a man had a suit of jeans colored with butternut dye and his wife a dress of linsey, they could appear with the best at a wedding or a quilting frolic. The superfluous could not have been said to exist in a community where men made their own buttons, where women dug roots in the woods to make their tea with, where many children never saw a stick of candy until after they were grown. The only sweetmeats known were those a skillful cook could compose from the honey plundered from the hollow oaks, where the wild bees had stored it. Yet there was withal a kind of rude plenty. The woods swarmed with game, and after swine began to be raised, there was the bacon and hoe cake which any southwestern farmer will say is good enough for a king. The greatest privation was the lack of steel implements. His axe was as precious to the pioneer as his sword to the knight errant. Governor John Reynolds speaks of the panic felt in his father's family when the axe was dropped into a stream. A battered piece of tin was carefully saved and smoothed and made into a grater for green corn. They had their own amusements, of course. No form of society is without them, from the anthropoid apes to the jockey club. As to the grosser and ruder shapes taken by the diversions of the pioneers, we will let Mr. Herndon speak, their contemporary analyst, an ardent panegyrist. These men could shave a horse's mane and tail, paint, disfigure, and offer it for sale to the owner. They could hoop up in a hogshead a drunken man they themselves, being drunk, put in and nail fast the head and roll the man downhill a hundred feet or more. They could run down a lean and hungry wild pig, catch it, heat a ten-plate stove furnace hot, and putting in the pig could cook it, they dancing the while a merry jig. Wild oats of this kind seem hardly compatible with a harvest of civilization, but it is contended that such of these roisterers as survived their stormy beginnings became decent and serious citizens. Indeed, Mr. Herndon insists that even in their hot youth they showed the promise of goodness and piety. They attended church, heard the sermon, wept and prayed, shouted, got up and fought an hour, and then went back to prayer just as the Spirit moved them. The camp meeting may be said with no irreverent intention to have been their principal means of intellectual excitement. The circuit preachers were, for a long time, the only circulating medium of thought and emotion that kept the isolated settlements from utter spiritual stagnation. They were men of great physical and moral endurance, absolutely devoted to their work, which they pursued in the face of every hardship and discouragement. Their circuits were frequently so great in extent that they were forced to be constantly on the route. What reading they did was done in the saddle. They received perhaps fifty dollars from the missionary fund, and half as much more from their congregations, paid for the most part in necessaries of life. Their oratory was suited to their longitude, and was principally addressed to the emotions of their hearers. It was often very effective, producing shouts and groans and genuflections among the audience at large, and terrible convulsions among the more nervous and excitable. We hear sometimes of a whole congregation prostrated as by a hurricane, flinging their limbs about in furious contortions with wild outcries. To this day some of the survivors of that period insist that it was the Spirit of the Almighty and nothing less that thus manifested itself. The minister, however, did not always share in the delirium of his hearers. Governor Reynolds tells us of a preacher in Sangamon County who, before his sermon, had set a wolf-trap in view from his pulpit, 
In the midst of his exhortations, his keen eyes saw the distant trap collapse, and he continued in the same intonation with which he had been preaching, Mind the text, brethren, till I go kill that wolf. With all the failings and eccentricities of this singular class of men, they did a great deal of good, and are entitled to a special credit among those who conquered the wilderness. The emotions they excited did not all die away in the shouts and contortions of the meeting. Not a few of the cabins in the clearings were the abode of a fervent religion and an austere morality. Many a traveler, approaching a rude hut in the woods in the gathering twilight, distrusting the gaunt and silent family who gave him an unsmiling welcome, the bare interior, the rifles and knives conspicuously displayed, had felt his fears vanish when he sat down to supper, and the master of the house in a few fervent words invoked the blessing of heaven on the meal. There was very little social intercourse. A visit was a serious matter involving the expenditure of days of travel. It was the custom among families, when the longing for the sight of kindred faces was too strong to withstand, to move in a body to the distant settlement where their relatives lived and remain with them for months at a time. The claims of consanguinity were more regarded than now. Almost the only festivities were those that accompanied weddings, and these were, of course, of a primitive kind. The perils and adventures through which the young pioneers went to obtain their brides furnished forth thousands of tales by western firesides. Instead of taking the rosy daughter of a neighbor, the enterprising bachelor would often go back to Kentucky and pass through as many adventures in bringing his wife home as a returning crusader would meet between Beirut and Vienna. If she was a young woman who respected herself, the household gear she would insist on bringing would entail an Iliad of embarrassments. An old farmer of Sangamon County still talks of a feather bed weighing fifty-four pounds with which his wife made him swim six rivers under penalty of desertion. It was not always easy to find a competent authority to perform the ceremony. A justice in McLean County lived by the bank of a river, and his services were sometimes required by impatient lovers on the other bank, when the waters were too torrential to cross. In such cases, being a conscientious man, he always insisted that they should ride into the stream far enough for him to discern their features, holding torches to their faces by night and by storm. The wooing of those days was prompt and practical. There was no time for the gradual approaches of an idler and more conventional age. It is related of one stout, one of the legendary Nimrods of Illinois, who was well and frequently married, that he had one unfailing formula of courtship. He always promised the ladies whose hearts he was besieging that they should live in the timber where they could pick up their own firewood. Theft was almost unknown, property being so hard to get was jealously guarded, as we have already noticed in speaking of the settlement of Kentucky. The pioneers of Illinois brought with them the same rigid notions of honesty which their environment maintained. A man in Macopin County left his wagon loaded with corn, stuck in the prairie mud for two weeks near a frequented road. When he returned he found some of his corn gone, but there was money enough tied in the sacks to pay for what was taken. Men carrying bags of silver from the towns of Illinois to St. Louis rather made a display of it as it enhanced their own importance, and there was no fear of robbery. There were, of course, no locks on the cabin doors, and the early merchants sometimes left their stores unprotected for days together when they went to the nearest city to replenish their stock. Of course there were rare exceptions to this rule, but a single theft alarmed and excited a whole neighborhood. When a crime was traced home, the family of the criminal were generally obliged to remove. There were still, even so late as the time to which we are referring, two alien elements in the population of the state, the French and the Indians. The French settlements about Kaskaskia retained much of their national character, and the pioneers from the south who visited them, or settled among them, never ceased to wonder at their gaiety, their peaceable industry and enterprise, and their domestic affection which they did not care to dissemble and conceal like their shy and reticent neighbors. 
it was a daily spectacle which never lost its strangeness for the tennesseans and kentuckians to see the frenchman returning from his work greeted by his wife and children with embraces of welcome at the gate of his dooryard and in view of all the villagers the natural and kindly fraternization of the frenchmen with the indians was also a cause of wonder to the americans the friendly intercourse between them and their occasional intermarriages seemed little short of monstrous to the ferocious exclusiveness of the anglo-saxon footnote michelet notices this exclusiveness of the english and inveighs against it in his most lyric style crime contre la nature crime contre l'humanité il sera expéi par la stérilité de l'esprit and footnote the indians in the central part of illinois cut very little figure in the reminiscences of the pioneers they occupied much the same relation to them as the tramp to the housewife of today. the winnebago war in eighteen twenty seven and the black hawk war in eighteen thirty one disturbed only the northern portion of the state a few scattered and vagrant lodges of potawatomies and kickapoos were all the pioneers of sangamon and the neighboring counties ever met they were spared the heroic struggle of the advance guard of civilization in other states a woman was sometimes alarmed by a visit from a drunken savage poultry and pigs occasionally disappeared when they were in the neighborhood but life was not darkened by the constant menace of massacre a few years earlier indeed the relations of the two races had been more strained as may be inferred from an act passed by the territorial legislature in eighteen fourteen offering a reward of fifty dollars to any citizen or ranger who should kill or take any depredating indian as only two dollars was paid for killing a wolf it is easy to see how the pioneers regarded the forest folk in point of relative noxiousness but ten years later a handful only of the kickapoos remained in sangamon county the spectre of the vanished people a chief named machina came one day to a family who were clearing a piece of timber and issued an order of eviction in these words too much come white man t'other side sangamon he threw a handful of dried leaves in the air to show how he would scatter the pale faces but he never fulfilled his threats further than to come in occasionally and ask for a drink of whiskey that such trivial details are still related only shows how barren of incident was the life of these obscure founders of a great empire any subject of conversation any cause of sensation was a godsend when vannoy murdered his wife in springfield whole families put on their best clothes and drove fifty miles through bottomless mud and swollen rivers to see him hanged it is curious to see how naturally in such a state of things the fabric of political society developed itself from its germ the county of sangamon was called by an act of the legislature in eighteen twenty one out of a verdant solitude of more than a million acres inhabited by a few families an election for county commissioners was ordered three men were chosen they came together at the cabin of john kelly at spring creek he was a roving bachelor from north carolina devoted to the chase who had built his hut three years before on the margin of a green bordered rivulet where the deer passed by in hundreds going in the morning from the shady banks of the sangamon to feed on the rich green grass of the prairie and returning in the twilight he was so delighted with this hunter's paradise that he sent for his brothers to join him they came and brought their friends so it happened that in this immense county several thousand square miles in extent the settlement of john kelly at spring creek was the only place where there was shelter for the commissioners thus it became the temporary county seat duly described in the official report of the commissioners as a certain point in the prairie near john kelly's field on the waters of spring creek at the stake marked z and d the initials of the commissioners to be the temporary seat of justice for said county and we do further agree that the said county seat be called and known by the name of springfield in this manner the future capital received that hackneyed title when the distinctive and musical name of sangamon was ready to their hands 
the same day they agreed with john kelly to build them a courthouse for which they paid him forty two dollars and fifty cents in twenty-four days the house was built one room of rough logs the jury retiring to any sequestered glade they fancied for their deliberation they next ordered the building of a jail which cost just twice as much as the courthouse constables and overseers of the poor were appointed and all the machinery of government prepared for the population which was hourly expected it was taken for granted that malefactors would come and the constables have employment and the poor they would always have with them when once they began to arrive this was only a temporary arrangement but when a year or two later the time came to fix upon a permanent seat of justice for the county the resources of the spring creek men were equal to the emergency when the commissioners came to decide on the relative merits of springfield and another site a few miles away they led them through brake through briar by mud knee-deep and by watercourses so exasperating that the wearied and baffled officials declared they would seek no further and springfield became the county seat for all time and greater destinies were in store for it through means not wholly dissimilar nature had made it merely a pleasant hunting ground the craft and the industry of its first settlers made it a capital the courts which were held in these log huts were as rude as might be expected yet there is evidence that although there was no superfluity of law or learning justice was substantially administered the lawyers came mostly from kentucky though an occasional new englander confronted and lived down the general prejudice against his region and obtained preferment the profits of the profession were inconceivably small one early state's attorney describes his first circuit as a tour of shifts and privations not unlike the wanderings of a mendicant friar in his first county he received a fee of five dollars for prosecuting the parties to a sanguinary affray in the next he was equally successful but barely escaped drowning in spoon river in the third there were but two families at the county seat and no cases on the docket thence he journeyed across a trackless prairie sixty miles and at quincy had one case and gained five dollars in pike county our much enduring jurist took no cash but found a generous sheriff who entertained him without charge he was one of nature's noblemen from massachusetts writes the grateful prosecutor the lawyers in what was called good practice earned less than a street sweeper to-day it is related that the famous stephen a douglas once travelled from springfield to bloomington and made an extravagant speech and having gained his case received a fee of five dollars in such a state of things it was not to be wondered at that the technicalities of law were held in somewhat less veneration than what the pioneer regarded as the essential claims of justice the infirmities of the jury system gave them less annoyance than they give us governor ford mentions a case where a gang of horse thieves succeeded in placing one of their confederates upon a jury which was to try them but he was soon brought to reason by his eleven colleagues making preparations to hang him to the rafters of the jury-room the judges were less hampered by the limitations of their legal lore than by their fears of a loss of popularity as a result of too definite charges in civil suits or too great severity in criminal cases they grew very dexterous in avoiding any commitment as to the legal or moral bearings of the questions brought before them they generally refused to sum up or to comment upon evidence when asked by the counsel to give instructions they would say why gentlemen the jury understand this case as well as you or i they will do justice between the parties one famous judge who was afterwards governor when sentencing a murderer impressed it upon his mind and wished him to inform his friends that it was the jury and not the judge who had found him guilty and then asked him on what day he would like to be hanged it is needless to say that the bench and bar were not all of this class there were even at the early day lawyers and not a few who had already won reputation in the older states and whose names are still honored in the profession cook mclean edwards kane thomas reynolds and others the earliest lawyers of the state have hardly been since surpassed for learning and ability in a community where the principal men were lawyers 
where there was as yet little commerce and industrial enterprise was unknown, it was natural that one of the chief interests of life would be the pursuit of politics. The young state swarmed with politicians. They could be found chewing and whittling at every crossroads inn. They were busy at every horse race arranging their plans and extending their acquaintance. Around the burgoo pot of the hunting party they discussed measures and candidates. They even invaded the camp meeting and did not disdain the pulpit as a tribune. Of course there was no such thing as organization in the pioneer days. Men were voted for to a great extent independently of partisan questions affecting the nation at large, and in this way the higher offices of the state were filled for many years by men whose personal character compelled the respect and esteem of the citizens. The year 1826 is generally taken as the date which witnessed the change from personal to partisan politics though several years more elapsed before the rule of conventions came in, which put an end to individual candidacy. In that year Daniel Pope Cook, who had long represented the state in Congress with singular ability and purity, was defeated by Governor Joseph Duncan, the candidate of the Jackson men, on account of the vote given by Cook which elected John Quincy Adams to the presidency. The bitter intolerance of the Jackson party naturally caused their opponents to organize against them, and there were two parties in the state from that time forward. The change in political methods was inevitable, and it is idle to deplore it, but the former system gave the better men in the new state a power and prominence which they never have since enjoyed. Such men as Governor Ninian Edwards, who came with the prestige of a distinguished family connection, a large fortune, a good education, and a distinction of manners and of dress, ruffles, gold buttons, and fair-topped boots, which would hardly have been pardoned a few years later, and Governor Edward Coles, who had been private secretary to Madison, and was familiar with the courts of Europe, a man as notable for his gentleness of manners as for his nobility of nature, could never have come so readily and easily to the head of the government after the machine of the caucus had been perfected. Real ability then imposed itself with more authority upon the ignorant and unpretending politicians from the back timber, so that it is remarked by those who study the early statutes of Illinois that they are far better drawn up and better edited than those of a later period, when illiterate tricksters, conscious of the party strength behind them, insisted on shaping legislation according to their own fancy. The men of cultivation wielded an influence in the legislature entirely out of proportion to their numbers, as the ruder sort of pioneers were naturally in a large majority. The type of a not uncommon class in Illinois tradition was a member from the South who could neither read nor write, and whose apparently ironical patronymic was Grammar. When first elected, he had never worn anything except leather, but regarding his tattered buckskin as unfit for the garb of a lawgiver, he and his sons gathered hazelnuts enough to barter at the nearest store for a few yards of blue strouding, such as the Indians used for breech clouts. When he came home with his purchase, and had called together the women of the settlement to make his clothes, it was found that there was only material enough for a very short coat and a long pair of leggings, and thus attired he went to Kaskaskia, the territorial capital. Uncouth as was his appearance, he had in him the raw material of a politician. He invented a system, which was afterwards adopted by many whose breeches were more fashionably cut, of voting against every measure which was proposed. If it failed, the responsibility was broadly shared. If it passed and was popular, no one would care who voted against it. If it passed and did not meet the favor of the people, John Grammer could vaunt his foresight. Between the men like Coles and the men like Grammer there was a wide interval, and the average was about what the people of the state deserved and could appreciate. A legislator was as likely to suffer for doing right as for doing wrong. Governor Ford, in his admirable sketch of the early history of the state, mentions two acts of the legislature, both of them proper and beneficial, as unequaled in their destructive influence upon the great folks of the state. One was a bill for a loan to meet the honest obligations of the commonwealth, commonly called the Wiggins Loan, and the other was a law to prevent bulls of inferior size and breed from running at large. 
this latter set loose all the winds of popular fury it was cruel it was aristocratic it was the interest of rich men and pampered foreign bulls and it ended the career of many an aspiring politician in a blast of democratic indignation and scorn the politician who relied upon immediate and constant contact with the people certainly earned all the emoluments of office he received his successes were hardly purchased by laborious affability a friend of mine says ford once informed me that he intended to be a candidate for the legislature but would not declare himself until just before the election and assigned as a reason that it was so very hard to be clever for a long time at once before the caucus had eliminated the individual initiative there was much more of personal feeling in elections a vote against a man had something of offense in it and sometimes stirred up a defeated candidate to heroic vengeance in eighteen twenty seven the legislature elected a state treasurer after an exciting contest and before the members had left the house the unsuccessful aspirant came in and soundly thrashed one after the other four of the representatives who had voted against him such energy was sure to meet its reward and he was soon after made clerk of the circuit court it is related by old citizens of menard county as a circumstance greatly to the credit of abraham lincoln that when he was a candidate for the legislature a man who wanted his vote for another place walked to the polls with him and ostentatiously voted for him hoping to receive his vote in return lincoln voted against him and the act was much admired by those who saw it one noticeable fact is observed in relation to the politicians of the day their careers were generally brief superannuation came early in the latter part of the last century and the first half of this men were called old whom we would regard as in the prime of life when the friends of washington were first pressing the presidency upon him in seventeen eighty eight he urged his advanced age as an imperative reason for declining it he was fifty-six years old when ninian edwards was a candidate for governor of illinois in eighteen twenty six he was only fifty-one and yet he considered it necessary in his published addresses to refer to the charge that he was too old for the place and while admitting the fact that he was no longer young to urge in extenuation that there are some old things like old whiskey old bacon and old friends which are not without their merits even so late as eighteen forty eight we find a remarkable letter from mr lincoln who was then in congress bearing upon the same point his partner william h herndon had written him a letter complaining that the old men in sangamon county were unwilling to let the young ones have any opportunity to distinguish themselves to this lincoln answered in his usual tone of grave kindness the subject of your letter is exceedingly painful to me and i cannot but think there is some mistake in your impression of the motives of the old men i suppose i am now one of the old men and i declare on my veracity which i think is good with you that nothing could afford me more satisfaction than to learn that you and others of my young friends at home were doing battle in the contest and endearing themselves to the people and taking a stand far above any i have ever been able to reach in their admiration i cannot conceive that other old men feel differently of course i cannot demonstrate what i say but i was young once and i am sure i was never ungenerously thrust back the man who thus consoled petulant youth with the experienced calmness of age was thirty-nine years old a state of society where one could at that age call himself or be called by others an old man is proved by that fact alone to be one of wearing hardships and early decay of the vital powers the survivors of the pioneers stoutly insist upon the contrary view it was a glorious life says one old patriarch men would fight for the love of it and then shake hands and be friends there is nothing like it now another says i never enjoy my breakfast now as i used to when i got up and ran down a deer before i could have anything to eat but they see the past through a rosy mist of memory transfigured by the eternal magic of youth the sober fact is that the life was a hard one with few rational pleasures few wholesome appliances the strong ones lived and some even attained great length of years 
but to the many age came early and was full of infirmity and pain if we could go back to what our forefathers endured in clearing the western wilderness we could then better appreciate our obligations to them it is detracting from the honor which is their due to say that their lives had much of happiness or comfort or were in any respect preferable to our own end of section three recording by veronica jenkins in ottawa illinois